speaker this morning is our associate vicar, Dan Malest, and uh, I heard him preach at the 9.30. He's got an amazing message. Um, I think it's a, a word from the Lord for this season. So will you give a really warm welcome to Dan as he comes to speak? Thanks, Miles. I, I wonder, what are your expectations for what God can do? I wonder what are your expectations for what God can do through you? Because today I believe that God's invitation to us is to lift up our eyes and expect more. Our reading for today uh, comes from John chapter 4. It's a sort of, you may know this story, it's called The Woman at the Well. Jesus encounters a woman at, at a well, that's the title, and there's this amazing interaction. But then afterwards, and I've never really looked at this before, he, he gets his disciples and he does a team debrief, a good team debrief. And that's the bit that we're going to focus on today. So the backstory is that Jesus is traveling towards his hometown and he decides to go through Samaria, which surprises his disciples because Jews don't uh, tend to get on with the Samaritans. They don't like each other uh, for a various number of reasons. And Jesus gets tired, so he stops at a well, sends his disciples to go and get lunch in the town. And then all by himself, this woman comes out. And it's noon, high noon, hottest part of the day. She's come out at this point because usually no one else will be there. She can be alone because she's not liked by her town. She's an outcast. Part of the reason we find out is that she's not just had one husband, she's had five husbands. And the guy she's living with now, she's, she's not married to. And so Jesus and her have this interaction. Uh, uh, and this is where we pick up our reading. Verse 25, the woman said, I know that the Messiah called Christ is coming. When he comes, he'll explain everything to us. Then Jesus declared, I, the one speaking to you, I am he. Just then, his disciples returned. Now here in my head, the soundtrack is something like, Dum, dee, da, 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 dum, dee, da, 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 dum. Because his disciples, they are not on the same page as Jesus. They are not the sharpest tools in the tool kit. And they are surprised to find him talking with a woman. But no one asked, what do you want or why are you talking with her? Because they're cowards. And then leaving the water jar, probably because of the funny looks the disciples are giving her, the woman went back to the town and said to the people, come see a man who told me everything I've ever done. Could this? be the Messiah. They came out of the town and they made their way towards him. Meanwhile, his disciples urged him, Rabbi, eat something. But he said to them, I have food to eat that you not know nothing about. Then his disciples said to each other, could, could someone have brought him food? You, you tap out? You, you tap out? <laughs> Judas, you did a grab food, didn't you? Always going behind our backs. My food, said Jesus, getting slightly annoyed, I imagine, is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. Don't you have a saying that it is still four months until harvest? I tell you, lift up your eyes. Look to the fields. They are ripe for harvest. Even now, the one who reaps draws a wage and harvests a crop for eternal life so that the sower and reaper may be glad together. Thus the saying, one sows, another reaps, is true. I sent you to reap what you have not worked for. Others have done the hard work, and you have reaped the benefits of their labor. Many of the Samaritans from that town believed in him because of the woman's testimony. He told me everything I've ever done. So that when the Samaritans came to him, they urged him to stay with them. And he stayed two days. And because of his words, many became believers. They said to the woman, we no longer believe just because of what you have said. Now we have heard for ourselves and we know that this man really is the savior of the world. Amen. 
All the way through this story, Jesus is misunderstood. It starts with the leaders misunderstanding him, the woman misunderstanding him, his disciples. And then if you carry on reading, he goes to his hometown and they don't get him there either. But Jesus does not want us to misunderstand. That's why he says to his disciples, it's why he says to us this morning, lift up your eyes. Because if we don't lift up our eyes, we might find ourselves in a situation where we miss out. We might find ourselves in the situation that one Mr. Almedia found himself in recently when he was so glued to his phone, he missed a rather dramatic event going on around him. We've got some CCTV footage that's going to come on the screen. Mr. Almeida is in the uh, turquoise blue uh, top there, and he is so glued to his phone that he does not notice an armed robber come into his bar and order everyone to the ground, and walk past him not once, after robbing the thing, he walks past him twice. And he does not notice, he's so glued to his phone that he does not notice even as the robber flees. Eventually, he notes somebody on the floor, laughs at them, before realizing the severity of his situation. Lift up your eyes. Jesus says, lift up your eyes or you will miss what is going on. And he says to do it, it means to do it in two ways. First of all, lift up your eyes in the physical. Like around here, what's going on around here is not normal, but neither is it enough. You know, like things like a few weeks ago, 60 people baptized. Last weekend, over 200 people on the Alpha weekend. 50 people training at SPTC, the college, training to plant churches. That's potentially 50 new church plants. This is not normal, but neither is it enough. Jesus says, lift up your eyes. He says it to his disciples because they've come back and they're a bit annoyed because he's talking to a woman of another race and another religion and he doesn't like the lunch they've got him. And Jesus says, lift up your eyes. Because if they had, they'd have seen a dust cloud in the distance of this entire town starting to leave and make their way towards Jesus. He says, lift up your eyes. Look at the signs of what is going on around you. But then realize that those physical signs point to a spiritual reality. Lift up your eyes and see that they point to something else. Lift up your perspective. Lift up your priorities. Lift up your expectation. And most importantly, lift up your vision. So lift up your eyes means for us to lift up our perspective. In verse 37, Jesus says this, Thus the one saying, one sows and another reaps, is true. I sent you to reap what you've not worked for. Others have done the hard work and you have reaped the benefits of their labor. Uh, I came across this recently. Many of you will have an appointments diary. An appointments diary, somewhere where you write your appointments. This was made by a British artist. This is a disappointments diary. A, a disappointments diary is a very British outlook on life, not to look at what's going well, but to focus and plan for the worst. It, it has a space to write down the numbers and names of people who will never call. It has a space to write down your bank insecurity questions. It has useful foreign phrases such as not guilty, your honor. And this is my favorite, a SWOT analysis chart that has a little bit of space for your strengths and opportunities and loads of room to record your weaknesses and threats. It can be so easy to focus on ourselves and our own weaknesses and our own challenges. But Jesus says, lift up your perspective. This is not about you. When you chose to follow Jesus, you joined a story that is bigger than you. It didn't start with you and it definitely won't finish with you. Uh, a while back, I got to hear a guy called John speak. And John is now in his 90s. But as a young man, he got ordained and he took on a, a pretty uh, kind of dying church in the center of London. And uh, it was dying kind of uh, spiritually. A lot of the congregation didn't know Jesus, but it was also dying literally because there were no young people there. And he said that as he would get up to preach every week to a mostly empty room, he would lift up his eyes to the empty balconies and he would pray in his heart, Lord Jesus, fill the balconies, fill them with people seeking after you. 
And the thing is, the Lord answered that prayer. The Lord answered that prayer and that church filled up. The balconies filled up. But then God went further and that church had so much life it had to start planting other churches. First in its city and then in its country and then a few years ago here in Kuala Lumpur. That church was HDB in London. That man was John Collins, a vicar, a pastor of that church through whom God brought renewal and revival to that place. So full that he didn't only fill the balconies there, he even started to fill up the balconies on the other side of the world. You are part of that story and it didn't start with you and it won't finish with us either. But it can be hard, can't it? It can be hard to not focus on ourselves, you know, and that's on a normal day, let alone on a day when things are difficult. But fortunately, Jesus has given us a powerful weapon. Um, Kate and I, uh, my wife, uh, we've just returned from the UK after the birth of our twins, Cassia and Clara. Uh, But I think we shared this before we left. Um, uh, Before we got pregnant, we had many, many years of infertility. And infertility is, I'm sure some of you will know this, it's, it's horrible. It's, it's this weird thing because it's like mourning for something that you never had. And it's a mourning that doesn't kind of ease with time, it gets bigger with time. And we found that the hardest thing was that it's quite hard to ignore it because every month you get this emotional roller coaster ride of finding out that yet again you're not pregnant. And so Kate and I, and if I can share this with you, we had this really simple practice that we found helped. Every month that we found out that we weren't pregnant, we would get together and we would worship. And we would sing just one song, which was uh, the king of my heart. Because that was our prayer, that our problems wouldn't be the king of our heart, but that Jesus would be king of our hearts. And then we would worship, and then I know this is strange, but we would, we would toast to God's goodness. I would go and get some champagne, well, carver, well, cheap sparkling wine, don't tell Kate that. And we would toast to God's goodness, because even when life is hard, God is good. And because our fear was that one day we might get what we wanted, but lose our relationship with Jesus through bitterness. Worship is a weapon that fixes our focus and it helps us to lift up our perspective. And the thing is, you are never too young to learn this. A a mum in the congregation sent us this this week. She writes this, our two-year-old has been fearful of many things, saying, mum, I'm a bit scared. And then she lets that limit the things she would do or the places that she would go. And so this mum was praying, asking the Lord, give me a tool to help my daughter. And she said it came. The next time she said that she was scared, she just yelled out, I'm not scared. I'm going to let my light shine. Jesus is Lord. He's going to let his light shine. Uh, That wasn't just spontaneous poetry. That's a a line from one of the kids' songs we sing with the bear at the beginning of the service. And, uh, And she said, it's amazing. A week on now, when her daughter is scared, she shouts out, I'm not scared. I'm gonna let my light shine. Jesus is Lord. He's gonna let his light shine. And then she goes ahead and does the things that she wants to despite her fears. That two-year-old has learned that worship is a weapon that fixes our focus and lifts up our perspective. Lift up your perspective. Next is lift up your priorities. In verse 34, Jesus says this, My food, said Jesus, is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. If you've got a smartphone in your pocket at the moment, you're probably going to get 85 notifications today. Some research points towards us touching our phones 2,617 times every day. How on earth, amongst all of that, are we supposed to decide what our priorities are? Well, Jesus here says it's a bit like food. He says, you know how there's some food that like leaves you feeling full and then there's other food that leaves you feeling unfilled, hungry. He said, it's a bit like that with life. And in the same way that life is too short for bad food, he says, your life is too short to fill it with things that won't leave you feeling filled. 
Don't eat things that leave you feeling hungry. Don't fill your life with things that won't fill you. What will fill you? Jesus says here, it's doing the will of the Father doing what God has called you to do. And he very helpfully summarizes what God wants us to do. Jesus summarizes the whole law as this, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and your strength, and your neighbor as yourself. And if you want a summary of a summary, it's love God with passion and love people on purpose. Love God with passion and love people on purpose. Lift up your priorities. And what I really love, what I love about being part of this church is this is not something new for us. I know that you guys are so servant-hearted. I know just on a Sunday, some of the teams here have been up since silly o'clock in the morning to come and serve us all. Uh, I think of the CHDBB team with our kids at this moment. A a few weeks ago, they put on a party for over 160 kids, half of whom were from outside the church. They built this amazing castle. They built a fairy wonderland. It was incredible. And even more than that, they then tied it up after themselves. Like, it's one thing to build amazing things. It's even another to take it down. Jesus says, do the things that will leave you feeling full. Because there's more going on than you realize. In verse 8, we read, His disciples had gone into town to buy food. His disciples had gone into town, and they thought they'd been sent into town to find lunch when really Jesus had sent them in there to find the lost. Do you think that you are in your workplace just to put bread on your own table? No, Jesus had put you in your workplace to put bread in front of others. Bread that will not spoil. Bread that leads to eternal life. Lift up your priorities. And then lift up your expectations. The thing I find challenging about this story is that everyone in it underestimates Jesus. They underestimate him. The the, the disciples, they should have known better. They're with him. In verse 29, it says this. uh, The woman says, come see a man who told me everything I've ever done. Could this be the Messiah? And they came out of the town and made their ways towards him. Meanwhile, the disciples urged him, Rabbi, eat something. Jesus is saying, look, I've revealed who I am. I've told people that I'm the Messiah. I'm here with everything you've ever hungered for. And I'm revealing it to the most unexpected people, the last, the least, the lost. I'm here. And the disciples are like, McCann, lift up your expectations. There's more going on than you realize. Then the religious leaders, they don't get it either. I love how this, the story starts. Verse one, it is just so human. It's kind of a tongue twister. Now Jesus had learned that the Pharisees had heard that he was gaining and baptizing more disciples than John. Although, in fact, it was not Jesus who baptized, but his disciples, so he left. It's like classic gossip. He said that she said that they said that that was going on when none of it was really happening. Uh, and these, these leaders, they should have known better. They see this sign, and they get it wrong in two ways. First of all, they, they just get it wrong. They see people getting baptized, and they turn it into a competition. But also, they underestimate it. They see, they see the people of God rededicating themselves to him, and they think that's the prize. When really, Jesus says, no, the real prize is when the racial outsiders, the religious outsiders, the Samaritans get to hear how much I love them and get the opportunity to come home. Lift up your expectations. And then the most challenging one is the woman. Because she's in front of Jesus. She's with him. And in verse 10, Jesus says to her, if you knew the gift of God and who it is that asked you for a drink, you'd have asked him. And he'd have given you living water. Sir, the woman says, you have nothing to draw with and the well is deep. The woman looks at Jesus in the physical and says, you've made this promise, but you have no bucket, dear Jesus, dear Jesus. She looks at him and says, you've got nothing. And he says, no, actually, I've got everything. And if you'll take the time to look at him, you'll end up saying what the Samaritans say when they say, we know that this man really is not just my savior, but the savior of the world. Lift up your expectations. 
And really, that lands in three questions. First of all, are you ready? Are you ready? Jesus says, lift up your eyes, look at the fields, they're ripe for harvest. Like, are you ready for what God is about to do? And one way to get ready is, is be here next Sunday, 5 p.m. for Kingdom Come. As Miles said, like, this is a time where we're going to pray. We're going to ask God to prepare our hearts for the season ahead. If you're like me and you find praying by yourself hard, come along and pray with others. You'll find it's going to be really fun. It's going to be a really fruitful time of prayer. Are you ready? The second question is, who around you is ready? Jesus says, the harvest is ripe for harvesting. Who in your life is ready to hear the news of God's love for them? Who in your life is ready to hear that God wants to forgive them? Because it, there are people, Jesus says, there are people ready. Tell them yourself. But also, as Miles said, invite them along at Christmas. Invite them to one of these many services. I, I, I just know so many times I've got to a service like that and the music started and I've gone, rats, I should have invited Bob or Barbara. Like, don't, don't wait till that moment to invite people. Like, think now, maybe get your phone out, look at your contacts. Aaron, who, is he ready? Barbara, see, we haven't got time for everyone. Zach and Yvonne can wait till next year. But, but go through your contacts. Who is ready? And then thirdly, and this is the most important, have you lifted up your eyes to Jesus? Have you taken the time to look to him? Because I know sometimes it looks like he has nothing and he's making these great promises. But really, as you look at him, he has everything. And the time is now. Even now, the one who reaps draws a wage and harvests a crop for eternal life so that the sower and reaper might be glad. What's on offer now is eternal life, not based on what you do or what your family does, but based on what Jesus has done for you on the cross. And the result in your life is joy. Lift up your expectations. And then the last way to lift up your eyes, the most important, is to lift up your vision to see yourself as Jesus sees you it fascinates me the thing that the woman says in verse 29 and it's actually repeated she says come see a man who told me everything I've ever done and that fascinates me because Jesus didn't tell her everything she'd ever done he, he, he told her about her sin but he, he didn't talk about the rest of her life but for her that's all she was she could not see past her sin and her shame. In the original language, the order is all the things, whatever I did, all the things, whatever she did, nothing she could do was not tainted by her sin and her shame. And Jesus looks at her and yes, he sees her sin, but he's able to lift his vision and see past her to see the daughter that he loves. And how is he able to do that? He does it because throughout his entire life, he lifts up his vision. But at the end of his life, he no longer lifts up his vision because instead he is lifted up on a cross. And on the cross, we read that Jesus said, it is finished. And then he bowed his head. Jesus bowed his head so that you could lift yours up, so that everything that keeps your head down, your sin, your shame, your refusal to believe that you are loved, you can now let go of that and look up. And as he bows his head and as you lift up your eyes, there are these moments where your gaze meets and that you know that you are loved. Last year, I am... Um, got to go on a leadership development course and, uh, and heard from a guy called Steve Burston. Steve uh, was a, a police officer and uh, specializing in a kind of finding gang crime and uh, trafficking of violent uh, of weapons. And uh, he was speaking on resilience. And really, he was using his life as an example of how not to do it. Because for him, when anything stressful came to him, his way of dealing with it was put it in a box, shut the lid, and put it to one side. And he, you know, his, he was in a stressful job. He was first on the uh, scenes of violent crimes. He rescued people from house fires where not everyone made it. He investigated terrorist attacks. And with each and every one of those things, he just put it in a box, 
pushed it to one side and then would go out for a drink with his mates. And because he was good at his job, he kept getting promoted and eventually he became a detective specializing in undercover work where the stress is max. He, he would end up in very dark places. He worked ridiculous hours. He would go months on end without a day off and that had a toll. It had a toll on his family life. His marriage broke down. His relationship with his kids broke down. And eventually his health. Eventually, one day, age 37, he had a heart attack from the stress. And he said at that moment, his whole life fell apart because he'd given up being a husband. He'd given up being a father. And now the only thing he was good at, being a police officer, he could no longer do. But in the way that the Lord works, in his wonderful timing. His wife, Liz, just before this, who was also a police officer, had come to faith. Uh, Somebody invited her on an alpha course and she came to faith in Jesus. And so when she heard what had happened to Steve, she called the local vicar and asked him to pay him a visit. And so this pastor came around, knocked on the door. Steve was a bit surprised, uh, hadn't been expecting this. And the, the vicar said, I'd love to come in and hear your life story. And Steve thought, great, free therapy. So began telling him. So two and a half hours later, he finished. And the vicar said, oh gosh, wow. Uh, well, if I were you, I'd read the Psalms. And uh, then he prayed for him and left. And Steve said, to be honest, he was hoping for a bit more. But the next day he hit rock bottom. And he said he had the choice on one hand of ending it all and on the other reading the Psalms. And so he gave it a go. And he started at the beginning and he started reading these prayers and he read and he read and eventually he got to Psalm 121 where it says, I lift up my eyes, where does my help come from? And he said in that moment, the Lord spoke to him because in, in his training as a police officer, he, when he was learning to drive at high speeds at 200 over kilometers an hour, he said you'd have an instructor next to him yelling, lift up your vision, lift up up your vision so you would see far down the road so you could see things as they really were before the crisis came and the Lord spoke to him in that moment and he looked to him and he came to faith in Jesus and it took time but slowly he was restored to his wife he was restored to his kids and even more amazingly he was restored to his workplace and he was able to go back to his original job but now he was able to lead in a different way in a sustainable way because he was no longer looking at himself for strength but lifting up his eyes and looking to Christ Jesus says lift up your eyes because I have done more than you realized. I am doing more than you realize and I want to do more in your life than you can ever expect. Lift up your eyes. Amen? Why don't we stand? 